Hey everybody, in this video, we're gonna talk about five kind of, I'd say, obscure or hard to research reasons to like living in Indianapolis or any of the surrounding metro. So we'll get into those five in this video. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, I'm Jason Compton with the Compton Home Group. Welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time to the channel and you wanna know everything there is to know about living in Indianapolis or any of the surrounding metro like the suburbs, then make sure you hit the subscribe button, tap the little bell so you're notified every time we do a new video each and every week. Now we get reach outs from people of all kinds from all over the country with questions about Indianapolis and what it's like to live there or any of the suburbs that surround Indianapolis. So if you've got questions about anything related to those, then make sure that you reach out any way that you know how. We'll always have your back with those questions and we'll certainly have your back whenever it comes time for you to make your move to the Indianapolis Metro. So in this video, we're gonna get into five things to like about living in Indianapolis. And these things are not the things that you can really research very easily. So I'd say you'd have to either live here for a time to start to notice these things, or at least spend some time in Indianapolis or any of the surrounding areas to notice any one of these things. So you can get online, of course, and, and research a lot of things, a lot of things about any city good and bad and you know of course there are sometimes some of those things that you just can't find they're just not enough information about them where people just don't share those things about those cities so indianapolis is no different it has a long list of things that are really small that are kind of unique about living here but you know they could apply to other places too but i will say that indianapolis certainly has some things that you need to experience being here before you're going to notice those and it could be good and bad for sure but we're just going through five things that I believe are good about living in Indianapolis and you may not be able to find so, so easily. So number one, we know that Indianapolis is a very populated city. If you include everything around Indianapolis itself, because just the city of Indianapolis, it's not quite a million people, it's, it's under that. But if you include Indianapolis and all of the surrounding suburbs, it's about 2 million people or so. So it is a pretty good size. I mean, it's in the top 20 in populated cities in the United States. But, you know, if you live in a place like New York or Miami or Seattle or, you know, some of these other really big metros that have a lot of people surrounding the city itself, the commutes are really usually pretty rough or, you know, people talk about the traffic being pretty bad. Now, Indianapolis, you can get some bad traffic, but usually it's at fairly predictable times, like in the morning rush hour and in the evening rush hour, but it, it's nowhere near what you're going to find in some other places. So at least when I talk to people from around the country that are looking at Indianapolis and they hear these commute times, they think, well, that's that's easy. That's, that's a joke compared to what we're actually used to. So you can live pretty much anywhere around Indianapolis or in Indianapolis and your commute from one side or let's say from where you live to where you work, it's going to be relatively short. It's certainly going to be under an hour unless the traffic is just insanely bad. And just as an example, you could live, let's say in the suburb of Noblesville. So if you go from downtown Noblesville, which everybody around here considers that pretty far north, and you wanna to get to Monument Circle in downtown Indianapolis, well, that's roughly a 40 minute drive, you know, as long as the traffic isn't all that bad, and that's just the sheer distance. And we're talking, depending on which route you actually take, because you can have multiple routes, and that's of course another problem with the traffic in other places, in other cities, is that sometimes you're stuck to really just one way of completing that commute. In Indianapolis and a lot of the places, you've got a few options here and there. One, of course, is most likely gonna be the interstates, but it's not as if you're locked into that. You can you can have some other choices. So going from all the way in Noblesville to downtown Indianapolis in well under an hour, close to 40 minutes, sometimes it could be a little bit faster than that, just depending on the traffic. That's not all that bad. Now, to me, a person that's lived in Indianapolis since 1997, and and I also grew up and came from a much smaller city than Indianapolis, I feel like that's a long way. I wouldn't want to do that every single day, but if you're coming from a place like Los Angeles or a lot of places in California or New York, and you know, you're looking at an hour or more for a one-way commute each day, then that's not all that bad. And that's pretty extreme, honestly, 
as far as distance is concerned in Indianapolis. So, you know, you can roughly say that maybe most things are gonna take 30 minutes or less or right at 30 minutes. And that doesn't seem so bad. So that's one really good positive, of course, about living in Indianapolis. And the other is that it's kind of fairly easy to get around too. Most of the streets are numbered, at least the east-west streets. So when you start in downtown Indianapolis and you start going north, you get to 10th Street and 20th and 38th and on up. And once you get to 96th Street, you know you're right on the northern edge of Indianapolis and you get north of that and you can get into the suburbs then. So like Carmel or Fishers and you get up to 116th Street and 126th Street and 131st, 146th. So if you're on one of those numbered streets, you've got a a feel for how far north you are at least. It doesn't happen once you go south of Indianapolis or Monument Circle, but certainly when you're going further north. And that makes it pretty easy a lot of times just to, to get around and to estimate really how far something is from where you are. So I'd say it's better than average as far as getting around in Indianapolis as far as a big city is concerned. So number two, and this is not something that like the first one's gonna affect your day-to-day -day necessarily. A lot of these, you'll end up maybe not having your day-to-day -day affected, but you will experience them at some point in your in some point in time and living around Indianapolis. But our airport, the Indianapolis International Airport, it's consistently ranked as one of the top airports in the country. And while it's not the biggest, and of course it's not the biggest because Indianapolis is not the biggest city, but it's definitely one of the best because it is really easy to get into and out of. Very, very easy. It's usually really easy to park, which is amazing for a lot of airports. And then security usually isn't all that bad. You know, especially if you have the pre-TSA, you can usually get through pretty quickly. There are of course some high times like around the holidays and high travel times that it's gonna be more crowded, but usually it's just not that bad. And there's only two terminals. There's an A and a B. Sometimes your walk to your gate down at the end of the terminal can be a bit of a distance, but usually it's just not that difficult to navigate our airport. And there are lots of direct flights to major cities from Indianapolis. Not every single city is connected by a direct flight, but there are a lot of them. And they're adding flights and even international flights, direct ones, each and every single year. So it's just getting better and better. And just the ease of getting in and out is really cool. So like I said, you know, that's not gonna affect your day to day, but if you fly out of Indianapolis or Indianapolis maybe once or twice a year, you go on vacation, especially with your kids, you know, we've got three young kids and when we fly out of the airport here, it's usually really pretty smooth. It's not that bad. And then of course, wherever we're going, it, it can be a different story because it's a lot more crowded, just busier. The layouts don't seem to be quite as efficient. And here in Indianapolis, I've got an opportunity to do that. So you will experience a really great airport. All right, number three, this is something that isn't unique to Indianapolis necessarily, but Indianapolis is a sports town and it's known as being a sports town. But like I said, it's not unique to Indianapolis. There are a lot of places that claim to be a sports town and can really back it up. You know, if you go to Boston or New York or Miami, Los Angeles, I mean, these are big sports towns. They have a lot of sports teams. Indianapolis is no different. And we've got the Pacers, we've got the Colts, we've got the Fever, we've got the Indianapolis Indians, which is a AAA team for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And the list goes on and on. We've got the Indy Fuel, we've got the Indy 11, there's a hockey and then a soccer team. Plus we've got Butler University here, basketball is gigantic. The NCAA headquarters are located right here in Indianapolis. And we host a lot of really big events. We've hosted the Super Bowl before. We host the NCAA Final Four for the men, for the women, really every so often. The PGA Tour, the Senior Tour, which is the Champions Tour, the LPGA Tour, they've all made stops here. They'll make stops again here in the future. So it is a big sports town and everybody takes a lot of pride in that. But one of the really neat things about a lot of our sports, and not just the sports, honestly, museums and the zoo, is that you could actually park in downtown Indianapolis and walk to not all of those events, but a good portion of them. So it is possible that you could actually go to, let's say, a Colts game at Lucas Oil Stadium, park for it, and then catch a baseball game later that day. That's if the seasons, of course, are overlapping. They barely overlap. Or the Fever, you could certainly do that. Go to a Fever game, you could go to an Indians game. You could do that very, very easily with a lot of things in downtown Indianapolis, because Victory Field, where the Indians play, it is 
right smack in downtown. It is a really incredible baseball stadium. And you know, if you're situated just right, you can see out of Victory Field, you can see Lucas Oil Stadium. You'd have to get out of the stadium and look down the street a little bit in order to see Bankers Life Fieldhouse, but you can easily walk to all of those things. The NCAA headquarters is right there, very walkable for many of those. The downtown Indianapolis area is extremely compact, very walkable, very safe for all of these events. Seems like there's always people around. So if you stayed in Indianapolis to see any of those things, then you would probably notice that. But if you've never been to a sporting event in Indianapolis, and then you start living here, and you start going to these things, it will be something that you'll notice. And you know, that's kind of awesome. You don't have to go all the way out into a distant suburb or just a distant town to get to your football stadium, your baseball stadium, and then come back in and you know, obviously go to a completely different part of the city to hit something else. So you could honestly spend the entire day in downtown Indianapolis and take in any one of those games. You go to any museum that we have down in Indianapolis. You could go to the zoo in Indianapolis. You could take in concerts while you're down there in Indianapolis. Of course, tons of good restaurants, but it's all very walkable. But that's a pretty neat aspect of the sports town feel that Indianapolis has. All right, number four, it's something that Honestly, most people consider good, although some people could consider it maybe inconvenient from time to time, and I've actually done another whole video on this topic because it can be so controversial, is that Indianapolis, you've got to spend some days here, especially in the summer, or live here, to notice that we're on Eastern time and we observe daylight savings time now and have just since 2006, but so it's been a good number of years at this point to know how this works, but Man, in the summer, with Eastern Daylight Savings and being on the far western edge of Eastern Time, it in the summer is light here until well past nine o'clock. At the peak of summer, so late June, let's talk about 4th of July. So if you wanna have 4th of July fireworks, you gotta wait well past 10 o'clock to get the sky good and dark before you can start those fireworks. Now you can start them if you want to, but it's gonna be in the daylight anytime before that. So after 10 o'clock is when it finally starts to really get dark. So if you have young kids and they go to bed at 7.30 or eight, in the middle of summer, it's gonna be light for a long time, but that's the negative aspect of it. The positive aspect of it is that if you get out of work at five o'clock on a summer evening, you've got until nine o'clock or past before you're running out of daylight. So if you have things to do outside at home, like mow the grass, do yard work, you got a lot of time to do it. If you wanna get out and go to the lake, or you wanna go play golf, or you just wanna hang out outside, let's say with your kids or just on your own, you've got a lot of daylight to do so. If you live way out on the East Coast, like in New York or the Carolinas or something, we're on the same time as you. And so of course it's gonna get darker much earlier for you out there on the East Coast than it is way over here in the Midwest where some people say we should be on central time, not Eastern, but we're on Eastern. So it is light very, very late in the evenings in the summer. And then when you look at it in the winter, in some places it's getting dark at 4.30 in the afternoon. For here, in the peak of winter, in the depths of winter, and it's dark at, and on a really cloudy day, it's gonna be after five o'clock, you know, in that 5.30 range. So it gives us a little bit more daylight in the evenings in the winter too. So. It's one of the things that, you know, you can see it on paper, but you have to really experience it and to see what it's like around the summer solstice in late June, let's say, and you're out at nine o'clock at night on a nice day in the summer, and man, you think it is still bright as can be out here. And you know, at eight o'clock in the evening, it doesn't even feel like it's close to dark yet, which is pretty bizarre, I think, for a lot of people when they're not quite used to that. And the fifth one, this is one that is definitely something that's probably a little bit more difficult to research, and it's not perfectly unique to Indianapolis, but the kind of going back to the easy to get around in Indianapolis and easy to commute, you know, one of the aspects of that, at least is becoming easier, is that we have a lot of roundabouts or traffic circles. Carmel, Indiana, which is a city on the north side of Indianapolis. It's a suburb of Indianapolis, but it's big. It's a little over 100,000 people or so. It has the most roundabouts or traffic circles of any city in the entire United States. I don't know what the number is right now. If you look online or research it, it's gonna say 125 or so, but that data is very, very old. 
there are plenty of other roundabouts that have been installed since then and more under construction. But that idea of roundabouts has leaked into every part of the Indianapolis Metro. So nearby Fishers, and then you get out to the west side and the north side, northern suburbs of Carmel, you get up to Westfield, Noblesville, you get to Avon, Brownsburg, Plainfield, Greenwood on the south side, and even Indianapolis itself, you have traffic circles, roundabouts. I personally love them. They're fantastic for traffic flow. They're fantastic for a lot of other reasons other than that and safety. They look so much nicer than traffic signals, but they are everywhere. And not every city is like that across the country. You still have a lot of traffic signals. You have stop signs, of course. You have yield signs. You have sometimes nothing at all, of course, if there's no intersection there. But it'll be something that will absolutely stand out, especially when you go to Carmel, Indiana. But leaking down into Indianapolis, you're going to see them as the years go by, especially increase in their numbers. There is no doubt about it. And when you're researching this whole area, you're probably never going to notice that or find any kind of data that says, oh yeah, by the way, when you get there, heads up on the roundabouts. Make sure you figure out how to enter a roundabout and get out of a roundabout and behave in a roundabout and how to drive around those things. So be aware that they are here. And for the most part, most people here think they're pretty positive. They do help out in a number of ways. So there you go, there are five things that you may not be able to research so easily about living in Indianapolis or the whole surrounding metro. If you have questions about any of those or anything else that you just can't seem to nail down as, as far as getting your question answered, then don't hesitate to reach out anyways you know how. And we'll always have you back with those questions. And until the next one, we'll see you later.